Well, if you have caught the past few episodes on this channel, you know that right now we are in the city of Munich. And uh, during World War II and in the years before, as I've mentioned in other videos, Munich was, was kind of the, the birthplace of national socialism. Uh, if, <laughs> if, if Nazism would have had a, a heart, it would have beat right here in Munich at places like this building right here. This is the building that was formerly known as the Fuhrer building or the Fuhrer bow. And uh, there are a couple other structures around here that we're going to be taking a look at and taking a look at some artifacts that were taken from here by US soldiers in April and May of 1945. Well, from 1933 to 1945, this spot right here probably would have been considered the most important to Hitler and the Nazis. So this building that you are looking at right here, uh, let me make sure I get this right, is the Munich Documentation Center for the History of National Socialism. Uh, and it stands on the site that was formerly known as the, the Brown House. This was the headquarters of the Nazi Party. It's where they kept all of their records for uh, members of the Nazi Party. It's also where they kept the blood flag, uh, which was the Nazi flag that had been stained with blood uh, during the Beer Hall Putsch. Uh, that thing disappeared in 1944 and nobody knows what happened to it. Uh, but now uh, has a museum standing in its spot. It was bombed out during World War II and uh, later destroyed. And this building right here, we have some road traffic that you'll have to excuse. This building right here is the Führerbau, or the Führer building. This was where Hitler kept his offices. And then uh, several high-ranking Nazis also had their offices there. What is really significant about this, at least to me, this is where Neville Chamberlain signed the Munich Agreement, uh, which handed over the Sudetenland of Czechoslovakia to Nazi Germany. Now, like I said, both of these buildings sustained damage during World War II, and when U.S. soldiers got here, uh, they went in and uh, basically had a field day uh, looting silver and flags and whatever they could get their hands on. Uh, so we're going to take a look at some of those artifacts here in a little bit, but first, uh, we're going to take a look inside of the, uh, the museum where the, the Brown House formerly stood. All right, we've uh, talked before about how in the years after World War I, uh, Germany was a place that was just in chaos. And uh, anytime you have chaos, well, that's fertile ground for the authoritarians to rise to power. And uh, if you look right here, it talks about a guy named Kurt Eisner. He was someone who had uh, led the overthrow of the monarchy in Bavaria, established a free state of Bavaria, but was assassinated, which led to some deep divides here in southern Germany. Now, it would just be impossible for me to show everything in this museum. Uh, but in short, w what you're seeing as you go through the documentation center here are, are these uh, lighted panels. And each of them have a certain topic, like this one is talking about Munich men in police units. Uh, so, so it gets really granular. Now, here is something that is really interesting that I had never seen before. Uh, this is the, the Führerbau or the Führer building, uh, but this is what it looked like in the spring of 1946 when it had been converted to the America House. Uh, so what had been the uh, office complex for Adolf Hitler uh, was turned into a place where uh, Germans were being taught democratic values 
and here they have some panels on the resistance movements in Munich. Uh, so, for example, like that of Sophie Scholl and the White Rose. If you're unfamiliar with that story, look it up because it is something else. Uh, and then here they also talk about religious and civil resistance. So there, there was a resistance movement within this regime. All right, that was pretty dang interesting. And uh, I know that I did not do as good of a job in there as what I could have. I uh, didn't show or talk as much as what I normally would, but there were a ton of people in there. And uh, I didn't want to ruin their experience or, or take away from what they were learning, uh, you know, by, by having me talk and, and narrate what I was seeing. So I, I talked where I could. But for the most part, it was really crowded and I wanted to be respectful of the people around me. Uh, but that was about as unflinching of a look at the, the rise of Nazism in Munich and in Germany as uh, what you'll see. But uh, anyway, I'm going to uh, link up with Eric now and, and take a look at a few things that came out of the Brown House and the Fuhrerbau. One other quick thing that I wanted to show here. So this is a, a little bit different view of the Fuhrerbau. Hitler's office would have been right there. And uh, there are a few other structures here, or rather the, the foundations of some structures that used to exist. You'll see one right here and another right over there across the street. Uh, there were two things here called the Temples of Honor, and they were built to honor the, the 16 men who died in the Beer Hall Putsch. And uh, after the war, uh, let's see, it was built in 1935, if I remember correctly, and in 1947, they ended up destroying these, uh, quote, Temples of Honor, um, and you know preventing them from becoming like a a nazi shrine uh there was talk i heard about destroying the foundations themselves uh one story that i heard is that there was some rare poison plant that was in there and they couldn't destroy them because of that i also heard another story that they couldn't destroy them because it would uh, possibly damage the the buildings around them but yeah this would have been a spot that was uh very important to the Nazis during the Third Reich era. I'd like to talk about two American soldiers who were some of the first Allied soldiers into Munich in May of 1945. In my left hand here we have a photograph of Sergeant Malcolm Miller who was in the 42nd Division and he was literally one of the first guys in. He not only went to Hitler's apartment, he came here to this area. We're standing in front of the Fuhrerbau right now and directly behind this building, which we can't see right now, is the Brown House. In my right hand, we have John F. Schwinder, who was in the 1269th Combat Engineers. He followed Sergeant Malcolm Miller closely after. He was 
sent to deactivate um, potential booby traps that may be in the basement of the Brown House. Both of these men had access to some of Hitler's silver. And as we do on the American Artifact series, we like to bring items back to their original spot. So what I did was I brought some of these items back. And to remain respectful to Germany's laws about public display of Nazi symbols, I covered them. So don't, um, don't kill us too bad in the comments, but I'm gonna show you some of these items. What we have down here is a formal pattern, Adolf Hitler spoon. And this came from Malcolm Miller, and it most likely came from the Führerbau here. This would not have been in Hitler's apartment. He had the other pattern, which we'll talk about in a moment. This is one of the napkins that Miller brought back. That potentially could have been from Hitler's apartment or here. You know, they, 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 he had them in both spots. Now, going over here to Schwinder's items, this is a formal pattern napkin. And he claims in his documentation that this came from the basement, the bombed out basement of the Brown House. Again, he was sent there to potentially deactivate any kind of booby traps that may be down there. This also came from Schwinder, and this is a informal pattern. Note the eagle is a little bit less um, fancy. And um, this is the pattern that Hitler ate with every day. The formal pattern that I talked about previously over here is the formal pattern. That would only be used for steak dinners and big massive um, events. But I thought it was important. Um, both of these groupings came to the Gettysburg Museum of History direct from the family. So I'm not only doing it for you guys, the watchers, I wanted to do this for the family of these two heroes who helped liberate Munich. Well, there you go. Uh, those are just a, a few things that came out of the, the Brown House and the Führerbau in the, the closing days of World War II. And uh, you might ask, you know, of course the, the Brown House is, is gone, was destroyed in 1945. Some people might be asking, uh, what is the Führerbau being used for now? I don't know if you can hear, but there's the sound of music coming out of this building. Uh, this is now a college for music and theater. So uh, some people would have said after the war that it represented evil and to tear it down and blow it up. Uh, but instead, what they did here was take something that was evil and uh, repurpose it into something good. Same thing with the Brown House where people can learn and uh, learn more about human nature and learn about this terrible period in history. And uh, think about how we can prevent things like this from ever happening again.